Welcome! This is Karen Alari, and today I'm going to be painting this little squirrel up in a blossoming treetop. I've had quite a few requests for both animals and flowers, so I thought this would be a good way to combine the two. I'll be taking it step by step so you can paint along with me today. I'm using acrylic paints. I use Golden Brand, but any good quality paint will do. I'm painting on a 9 by 12 stretched canvas and I'll be talking about the brushes I'm using as we go along. What I did first was blocked in the entire uh, canvas in a gray color. This was a gray overcast morning and after I did that I, I divided the canvas into thirds horizontally and vertically making a sort of a tic-tac-toe pattern and you can see that when you use photo editing software you can crop your photo and put those same um, thirds grid lines onto your photograph to help you in drawing out your design. So after I let the underpainting dry I just started in with a simple sketch in pencil using those grid lines to help me get get the features in the right places and to help me with my drawing. Next I'm switching to blocking in using basically black and white. I'm, I'm focusing on my values in this first part of the painting. So I've fo focused in on the squirrel and changed the photograph that I'm using for reference to black and white. This helps me get the values in the image that I'm using defined more clearly and helps me get it to looking more realistic in, in the outcome. I really suggest that you do this phase, this sort of black and white. You can add a little color as I'm doing now, warming up that gray with a little bit of red. But the concept is don't think so much about the color at this first stage, but just try to get your values right. And values are relative light to dark, white to black. So those are really the keys in creating a realistic painting in realistic images is to get your values correct. I had given you on the screen there uh, the mixture I use to create a dark paint. I don't use black on my palette. Instead I use a mixture of those three colors in order to create a dark that's fairly transparent and much more rich in color than the two blacks that you would normally get. So again, the concept here is to look on your image before you start worrying about color, before you start worrying about surface texture and animals especially. Look at the overall shapes. That little animal is made up of, of round circular areas and cylindrical areas. And you want to think about the shape of those and trying to identify the shape using just dark, medium, and light paints. You can see I'm putting the lighter areas where I see lighter areas on on the reference photo and the darker areas where I see darker areas, medium areas where I see medium areas. Try to just squint your eyes, ignore all that detail of the fur and everything else that's going on in the animal. And this is true whether you're painting a dog, a cat, an elephant, a giraffe, whatever you're painting. You want to first get the overall underlying shapes as if you know it was just a, a com combination of geometric forms and do that with this black and white. I'm just using a, a bristle brush it's a, about a half an inch wide and probably a little less and it's fairly stiff so that's a good brush to use in this blocking in phase you're not looking for detail again, you're just looking for getting those big shapes in the right value. You'll notice that I also used some of the background color and painted in around the shape in order to get it a little more accurately. That's called negative paintings when, when you paint around the shape instead of painting the shape directly. Here you can see my the palette of paints that I use, the names are alongside the screen there. And I set my palette up in the same order every time. It's pretty important to do that. Get used to the way your palette 
is set up, the way your paints are set up, so you know right which area to go to when you're looking for a paint and you don't you don't have to stop and think about that. So what I'm doing at this point, since I, I've got my squirrel blocked in just in its basic values, now I'm mixing up a variety of green shades. The same concept, I'm using green, but I've just mixed up a dark, a medium, and a light shade of, of green. And I'm looking at my reference photo, and I'm squinting my eyes, and I'm ignoring all those details of the leaves and the flowers and whatnot and I'm looking for the dark areas. Now one thing what, that happens when you're using acrylic paints, which is a really wonderful thing about this medium, is that you can continue to put in layer after layer. In other words, I can put down these colors and put more colors on top right away because they've dried and they're not going to mix. Your color isn't going to get muddy. You're not going to lose your brush stroke definition because the colors underneath are already dry. I love that about acrylic paints. So I'm just really loosely looking for those dark areas, mid, mid ground areas, and light areas. And you start generally with the dark colors because you can come back in and paint right over the top of them you start with dark colors and then add your medium tones, add your light tones on top of that. And that creates this wonderful texture and this interest and, and you see little bits of the colors peeking through. And that's what my technique of painting with acrylics is all about. It's layer after layer after layer, uh, starting with big shapes and then refining. I slowed this part of the video down a little bit so you can see how I'm actually using the brush. So pay attention to how I'm holding the brush. I'm not holding it like a pencil. I'm holding it fairly loosely in my hand, gripped with my thumb and my fingers. And then I'm thinking about the direction that the leaves grow in. And I'm moving my paintbrush back and forth, back and forth, and loosely creating those shapes, those general shapes. I'm still not worrying about detail. That's the great thing about this technique is you can start very loosely and uh, in a very with a very free motion with your brush strokes and as you go along you can get more and more refined but you don't have to too. You can stop at every any level of the refinement and have a more impressionistic painting or you can continue on and make a much more realistic painting, which we will be doing at least with certain areas in this painting today, specifically with the squirrel. We're going to go down to some pretty um, detail, distinct detail with the squirrel and the area right around the squirrel. The squirrel is our focal point, and so when you're doing a painting, you always want to define in your mind what is my focal point? Why am I painting this this particular painting? And then you're going to take your reference photo and you're going to make adjustments to color, to focus, to detail in order to bring more attention to your focal area. Basically you want to take your viewer by the hand and lead them into your painting and show them around. Um, and so you do that by creating a visual path using contrasts, generally, in order to lead the eye around the painting and into your focal area. That was one of the things I really liked about this reference photo, is the way the blossoms and the tree branch arced around the squirrel, creating sort of a natural focal point and a natural path for your eye to follow to get to it. I want to talk about color here too. I've been putting the names of the paints up on the screen so you could see them and follow along with them. Um, I'm using a lot of this quinacridone magenta, which uh, is a very transparent, bright, highly pigmented paint and mixes well with other paints and creates a nice, vibrant magenta color. Here I've just mixed up a whole string, string from dark to light in 
the magenta with that dark mixed color added to it. And I've also mixed up a little cadmium red with white to give myself uh, two different pink options, a cooler pink and a warmer pink in the cadmium red. When I talk about a cool or a warm color, we're talking about a cool color is going to lean more towards the blue end of the spectrum, and a warm color is going to lean more towards the red-yellow end of the spectrum. So you can have cool and warm versions of, of every color, a cool and warm red, a cool and warm yellow, a cool and warm blue, and that's actually what my palette is made up of. So you can choose in any situation whether you're wanting a, a warmer paint color or a cooler paint color. And those are all things that you learn as you paint. The more you paint, the more you get to know your paint colors and how each one reacts. Beyond just the color itself, each paint pigment has its own characteristics. Some are more transparent, some are more opaque, some mix well with others, some don't mix as well with others. For example, this cadmium red that I put in the mix there is one that doesn't mix as well, it tends to go a little muddy if you mix it too much. So I've switched over here to my round soft brush. This is the kind of brush you might use in watercolor. And I've slowed it down again so you can see the type of brush strokes I'm using now. Now that I've moved into the blossoms, I'm describing a sort of a blossom shape with my brush. I'm thinking about they're sort of rounded on top, but I'm still holding my paintbrush fairly far back on the brush, holding it loosely between my fingers and thumb. I'm not trying to get into any detail. I'm trying to create sort of um, natural, easy shapes that you might see in nature. So here I've, I've gone to a more rich color. It's That was pretty much pure magenta with a little bit of yellow added to it. Now I'm adding some alizarin crimson and some white. So every time I go back to the palette, um, I use up, a, a, a once I've used up, a pile of paint that I've mixed, I'll change that color a little bit. Another part of my technique is this many, many different shades and colors in the different um, in the different layers of paint that I'm putting on there it just adds more interest and adds to the realism as well. You, you can see how much paint I'm using. I, I find a lot of time with times with beginning uh, painters especially when they're using acrylics, they tend to put little tiny bits of paint out on their palette. And with acrylic, um, I find you'll be much more successful just really get some paint on that palette and get some paint on your brush. You can see how often that I, I go back to my palette when I, I'm, I leave the painting and go off screen. I'm actually going back to my palette and picking more paint up. So I don't do very many brush strokes before I actually mix more paint and pick up more paint. One of the things that I'm changing about the photograph is you can see it has sort of an overall lighting and color to it. And as we talked about earlier in the idea of having a focal point, I want to de-emphasize some areas of the painting and emphasize the areas that are around my focal point. So the blossoms that were in the bottom portion of the painting, I'm making more in shadow and looser, less distinct. So you can see the colors that I used down there. I added a little blue into the magenta and made that area more in shadow as opposed to the area right around the squirrel. I've gone back now and mixed some brighter green colors. Uh, I don't use a a tube green on my palette. Instead, I use my two blues and my two yellows, actually three yellows, including the Quindacridone Nicolazzo Gold, and the combination of those all makes some wonderful greens. Again, I've slowed it down a little bit so you can see the brush strokes that I'm using to make the leaves. I'm describing the shape differently than I did when I was painting the blossoms. Those were a more rounded brush stroke. 
In this one, I'm making sort of leaf shapes by by creating points and and just in the way that I'm holding and using my brush. One thing to remember is to vary the way you're holding your brush. I'm not at the way you're holding it in your fingers, but the angle that that the brush hits the canvas on. In other words, I will move my whole arm sideways, up and down, back and forth to create um, brush strokes that start and end in different directions, if that makes sense. Adding a little blue to this green mix, do you see how on my, can on my palette, um, one thing about acrylics, of course, that we all know is that they dry quickly. And so you can't mix up a big batch of a certain color and then have that color still be there. It'll dry out. So you have to mix as you go. And you can just mix right into the same general area. I usually have a general area that's green, a general area that's whatever colors I'm using, and you mix as you go. Here I'm coming back in with my background color again and I'm painting negatively. So what that means is I'm painting around the shapes that are there. I'm using it partly to cover up my pencil marks that were in the background and I want to get a nice thick layer of paint over this this background area which has only had one layer of paint so far. So besides those two things, I'm also creating interesting shapes in the leaves and the flowers on the edges by painting around them and bringing the background color into the shapes a little bit and refining those shapes. That's called negative, painting the negative space. I'm also painting interior holes. In, in a landscape painting you would call these sky holes. When you come back in with the background color and you paint into the existing mass of color that's already on the canvas, creating little holes where you're peeking through to the sky behind. One thing to think about when painting sky holes is in general you want your paint color to be slightly darker than the color that you used actually out in the sky itself. There's just something about the optical nature when you surround a small area of lighter color with darker colors it tends to automatically look lighter. So if you don't darken that color a little bit for your sky holes, they'll really pop out more so than you want them to. So now that I've got my base over the entire canvas, I've got light, medium, and dark in my general color tones. I put a first layer of the, of the leaves and the flowers down so that they've reached a certain level of of detail. And as I said before, you can actually stop your painting at this point if you want a more impressionistic uh, look to your painting. You don't want detail. You can, you can stop here, but you need to start with that foundation, that base. I think it's really important to do, and, and you'll be more successful in your painting if you start with this sort of impressionistic base. I like to think of it as you start with an abstract painting and you're block in and you move to an impressionistic painting in your first layers and then you can continue on into a realistic uh, painting all the way into photo realize, realism by just adding the layers on top. So now I'm working on bringing more realism to our little squirrel and we got our black and white and gray, our values set and now I'm adding a little more color to it and identifying my main uh, features a little more. I'll often start with the eye when I'm working with an animal. That just helps me to get the personality of, of the little guy down on canvas right away. And that just helps me start to feel who this little guy is. It's You're not just copying a photograph, but you're trying to bring the essence of this perky little squirrel into your painting. And so getting getting an getting the eye kind of established, getting his facial expression kind of established helps me to just get that feeling for him. I always say when you're painting, if you want your painting to have a certain mood, a happy mood, a lighthearted mood, or if you're 
going for a sad mood or a contemplative mood, you want to be in that mood when you're painting. And then that somehow translates into the painting and gives your painting spirit and life. The colors I'm using here um, are just variations of those brown tones. So brown is orange and is an orange color. So it's red and yellow, and then it's mixed with uh, blue, which is its complement. That's something about um, to talk a little bit about color mixing for a minute. Whenever you want to neutralize a color, make it more gray, you want to add its complement. So you'd add blue to orange, you'd add red to green, you'd add purple to yellow, and adding a little bit of that can gray it down as much or as little as you want. And using uh, complementary colors to create grays makes much more beautiful grays than just using a tube black. So I do use my, my mixed uh, dark here as well to create some of these dark colors. So I'm just looking at my reference photo and again I had those large shapes of dark, medium, and light and as you go to refine a, uh, an image and make it more realistic, all you're doing is taking those large shapes and breaking them into smaller shapes. So amidst the dark areas there's going to be some variations in the dark. There's going to be some subtle changes in tone and color and in each large area that you have, the medium tones, the light tones, you're going to have those subtle variations. And that's, it's just a process of going from big to little that way. I've changed brushes here to a small round bristle brush. And this is um, a fairly well used bristle brush. I like to use a bristle brush in making, uh, making fur and animal kind of textures because they just uh, have lots of different points and areas and they make a, a a mark that's less distinct and and is more, has more texture to it. So I've switched back actually at this point to my soft brush here and I'm putting in some more of this detail right around his face. Again using acrylics you can do this method where I've probably put five or six layers on on his little face already. Um, just moving into trying to capture his expression and and capture the right values to create both form and and realism so and you can do that with acrylics because as they dry again you just paint right over the top and if you paint right away you can do a certain amount of mixing and blending so I can put the paint down and then come in with some lighter or darker right away and blend it a little bit or you just wait a very short period of time and you can paint right over the top. So I've continued to refine his eye going back and forth with lights and darks put a little tiny spot in there for the gleam in his eye so I can start uh, getting his personality and, and he's watching me paint now so so I better do a good job <laughs> anyway coming back and forth trying to this area in his mouth is kind of in shadow with a little bit of light on his mouth itself. Now I've switched over to my bristle brush. This is um, the one that has a more will give you more texture as you as I'm starting to think about the fur. You notice as I put in the brush strokes I'm thinking about the direction that his fur grows. I'm still holding holding the brush fairly loosely and I'm moving my arm around my whole arm around in order to make the brush strokes in the right direction and I'm thinking about the direction that his fur grows so wherever I'm placing placing the brush strokes I'm stroking them in the direction that the fur grows I'm also using a very light touch at this point. In other words, I'm not 
pressing that paintbrush into the canvas, I'm very lightly skimming it over the surface. And what this does is it helps leave some of the other colors that are below it. So you get this wonderful textured effect of all the different colors back and forth. Working on his tail here, and here you can really see how, how I move my hand and my arm completely around in order to describe the way the hair grows on, on his tail. Just looking at my reference and looking where I see a dark, where I see a medium, there I saw I can see some more of the warm orangish, reddish, brownish colors. So all of these mixtures I'm using in paint, I'm just using some red, some yellow, a little bit of my dark mixture, and then whenever I see an area that needs to be darker or lighter, I can add white, I can add my dark mixture. If it needs to be more colorful, I add a little more red. If I need it to be a darker area, I might add my crimson, which is a darker red. A, a lighter area, I might add my cadmium red and then add some yellow with it or some quinacridone gold. Here I've used quinacridone gold and I've added some cadmium red to it to give this sort of a reddish orange color. I can lay that down where in areas on his body where I see color and then I can come back later with light over the top of it. Notice how I'm moving all over the the whole figure of the squirrel. I'm not staying stuck in one uh, small location and completing it uh, to finish. Instead, I'm working throughout the squirrel, using the same colors throughout the squirrel and bringing the detail up together, sort of at the same time. This this works a lot better than completing a whole area and then moving to the next area. It just helps you have a more integrated um, image when you're done. The colors and the brush strokes and the way you've formed it. Here I'm moving back in to refine the forms of the squirrel. Um, again, I'm using that, I used that background sky color to refine the shape of his neck and his back. I used the, the telephone wire or the power line that he's walking on. I raised that a little bit. Just use, using the edge of my brush there to against it and realizing that his back is actually even with or a little bit higher than his head. So I use that brush to create a straight line and just check the relative positions of things in the in the in your drawing itself. So then I raised up his back a little bit and I can see that his body was a little too long. I needed to raise that up a little bit so I came in with the dark. And you can see how easy that is to do. Don't get don't don't get stuck on uh, a certain area of your painting. Oftentimes I see beginners they do one little area and they think, oh that's just perfect. I did that perfectly. I don't I never can do that again and so I don't want to change it. Don't feel that way. If you did it one time, you can do it again. And every time you do it again, you get better at doing it. So even though I'd gone pretty far and putting a lot of texture into his body, I realized that my shape was a little off. I wanted his whole body to be a little narrower, not quite so deep. I needed to raise the shape of the back. So I just went right back in with adding more layers. You don't need to worry about, oh, I've ruined it, or I have to scrape it off, or if I have to start over. These are wonderful acrylics, and you can just go right over the top. You don't lose definition. You don't get mud. mud. You just can put down fresh new brush strokes right over the top and start again, and you just have more layers which create interest um, in your painting underneath it. So I, I put down that warmer color, I put down the darks, and then I came back with some lights. Just in general, you're going to work that way, dark to light. So start with your shadow colors first, move to your lighter colors and your lighter colors. I'm continuing uh, to refine, putting my darks back in, and here I'm 
painting the negative shape that's underneath his belly, putting some green in there, which will be more of my background. In the, in the reference photo, there's a very bright spot of pink underneath his belly, and I probably don't want a lot of attention drawn to that area of the squirrel, so I wouldn't necessarily use that bright pink because you can see how it really kind of draws your eye. Instead, I'm just going to use some dark greens underneath that. Continuing to go back and refine his face some more because I'm looking for um, a fairly realistic image this time. Again, you could stop at any point. You don't have to go as uh, realistic as this. You could stop at something that was more loose and impressionistic anywhere along the way. I just know that this is my focal point and in this particular painting I want to uh, show you guys how I would paint something more realistic and so I'm going further with this little squirrel. Again, placing darks, coming back in with lights, moving into some smaller detail now. So I've changed back over to my smaller, softer brush and I'm coming in change the position that I'm holding my brush into the way that you would hold a pencil and that's because I'm working on some very small detail here trying to get those lights in around his ear and around his eyes and around his mouth and I mean in areas where I see fur I'll create brush stroke like fur in areas where I don't I won't I won't use those type of brush strokes. Whenever you get a little creature like this who's sitting in an environment with a lot of bright color, which is what this little squirrel is sitting in the middle of these flowers, you're going to get some of that color reflected in onto the squirrel himself. So that's why I put a little bit of that pink on the lighter areas of his belly where he's close to some of those blossoms because that pink will be reflecting right up onto his fur. That helps you to integrate your your image into its environment a little bit and it's a, a really great technique to use. That's called reflected light and uh, it's very helpful in, in painting. When I went inside of his ears and around his nose I added a little bit of red to that mixture to make it a little a little warmer and a little more a little more red like the interiors of, of skin would be. You, you would find this a lot especially if you're painting uh, dogs or kitties or anything like that. Their, their ears around their noses certain areas are gonna have a little more warmth to the color. Again just lightening up using some quinacridone gold with some white a little bit of red to it to create some lighter, warmer tones. You know, often when you're looking at your reference photo, um, you're going to want to do what we call pushing the color, which just means seeing the color that's there, um, but then emphasizing it a little bit, especially when you're working in your focal area. You might want to push those colors, make them more dramatic, make the contrast more dramatic because those are the things that draw your eye to your focal point. Basically, contrast draws your eye, so dark against light, uh, complementary contrasting colors against each other, um, dull colors against bright colors. In this case, uh, I'm using the realism, so the detail against a less detail environment to draw your eye to the squirrel. And also, because the blossoms and the tree and the leaves are so brightly colored and rich, his dull colors will stand out, and that contrast of, of his more dull colors against the bright colors will draw your eye right away as well. So just continuing in thinking about the form, the roundness of his, of his little haunches and belly area, I want him to be a fat little happy squirrel. So I'm being sure to 
form that shape with shadows around the edges, lighter uh, where the form is coming forward um, to create the form itself with those with those shadows, shadow and light. You'll notice I also reformed um, his his tail and how deep uh, the tail was, and I'm doing that by looking at the space around the squirrel. So when you're working on drawing like that, look at the angle formed by his back and his tail and try to mimic that angle in your drawing. Look for those angles and those reference points that you can use in drawing. It will uh, help you a lot with getting your drawing in shape. Also look for areas that you can line things up. For example, the bottom of his eye runs about parallel with the top of his nose. And the inside corner of his eye, if you go straight down from there, is about the inside corner of his mouth. So those kind of lining up of, of the major uh, features will help you to get your drawing more accurate. I'm back to my bristle brush at this point. I've got a lot of paint on that brush and I'm holding it very, very loosely and just barely skimming the surface. The wonderful thing about having these um, many, many layers of paint as I do in, in this technique is that as you get to the top layers, you can just barely skim your brush over the surface and it will catch on these different layers in different ways and, and give you a very a natural, organic look to your brush stroke. Laying in the dark and then coming back with light and coming back into the dark, just back and forth from dark to light and light to dark, always searching for that right value in order to create that um, illusion of, of realism. Again, looking at, at the reference photo, I can see little spots Squinting your eyes is really helpful. If you wear glasses like I do, you can just look over the top of your glasses and you can see the image blurred without a lot of detail. And that, that will help you to see the areas that are generally lighter and darker. And it's so important, compare, compare. So compare an area to the area right next to it. Ask yourself, is this area lighter or is this area darker? than the area around it. Is it more colorful? Does it have more red? Does it have more yellow? Just continually ask yourself those comparison questions. When you look at your painting and you say, well, that's just not right. I don't know what's wrong. Compare it to the area next to it. So say, look at that area and say, is the area next to it lighter? Is it darker? And how much darker or lighter? Squint your eyes and look at the comparison of values. Is it quite a bit darker, a little bit darker? Try to find that, that just the right comparison of those two. So I think we've got our squirrel pretty well down to as much detail as we want it. So now I'm going to switch back to adding detail to the flowers. And again, I'm going to be looking to add detail more right around the squirrel and less as I move away from the squirrel and that will draw the eye from the area of less detail into the area of detail which creates movement in in your painting it creates movement of the eye it just doesn't look at everything and everything is in the same detail and the same focus and so your eye doesn't know where to look so let's think about the colors that we're using here again I'm wanting to put some more warm tones into these flowers. So I'm using my quinacridone uh, golds and my yellows and my magentas and I'm mixing them up to make all kinds of varieties of peaches and pinks. So to make a warmer pink like I started with here, I used the magenta but I added some yellow to it. And we've got two options with our yellow. We can 
use our uh, Hansa yellow light or we can use our cadmium yellow medium. Cadmium yellow medium is a warmer color and uh, has much more tinting value to it. It's a stronger yellow. And Hansa yellow light is a cooler yellow and it's also a more delicate uh, pigment. So it's not as strong. So when you mix it, it's going to add a subtle bit of yellow to the mixture and instead of a, a strong, vibrant yellow. So as you get used to your, your paint colors, um, that you'll start to get the feel for your different pigments. You notice I'm, I've gone from dark to light again. I'm using a smaller brush because I'm going down to more detail. Here I'm mixing back up a dark again using alizarin crimson with some ultramarine blue to make a purple and I'm adding a little bit of white. This is, and, and then going back and adding some more of my magenta and blue. So this creates a more cool purpley color because remember down in this area of the painting I'm trying to create um, a shadowed, some shadowed tones. So these are, these are blossoms that are in shadow. Again, just using that brush and putting down darks and then coming back over with medium tones and lighter tones. Thinking about those external shapes that the blossoms are forming and I'm reforming them a little bit, adding more detail. Using round circular shapes darks, then mediums, then lights. Many, many layers over and over again. Coming back in here with some very light. Um, it's white with a little bit of cadmium yellow added to it just to make some very warm lights. You want to remember when you add titanium white to a color or when you're going to your sunlit areas they're going to be warmer as well as being lighter. So titanium white has a cooling effect on a color. If you just add titanium white to your mix, you're going to get a cooler, lighter version of your mix. And that's not the way sunlight generally is. Sunlight generally creates a warmer, lighter version of the color. So be sure to add a little bit of yellow or a little bit of red to your titanium white whenever you make a lighter version to, to paint your sunlit areas. Going back to my greens again and I've gone back to my flat uh, bristle brush here. Actually this isn't a bristle, this is a soft brush. So I've gone back to a flat brush in order to make my shapes of the of the leaves and you can watch the way I'm forming those brush strokes again. I've got this green now and I'm adding some white to it, a little bit of thalo blue and a little bit of my Hansa yellow light. Thalo blue and Hansa yellow light are going to make a very bright clear green. So it's going to be more those kind of spring greens, those light spring fresh greens that you see more so than you would get with say an ultramarine blue and the cad yellow that's going to make much um, sort of a warmer, slightly muddier green than, than you would get using phthalo blue. Phthalo blue is a very transparent, very rich uh, tone and makes very, very clear colors, but you have to use it very sparingly because it's very strong and it will uh, take over your mixture very quickly. Came, I'm coming back in with just almost some pure uh, of my dark mixture, I've added a little bit more alizarin crimson to it to give it a warmth. Generally, when you're using your darkest dark areas, whereas your shadows are going to be cooler, your very dark areas you want to keep a little bit warm. They're just they just look better and look more realistic. So, I've gotten a little bit of alizarin crimson in with that mix to make sure that the very dark areas are warm. Here I'm coming in with my quinacridone gold. I mixed it with a lot of water. The squirrel is dry completely and all I'm doing is putting a wash over this squirrel. I just generally wanted to warm him up a little bit as I compared him to the rest of the work I was doing. 
So I thinned out the paint quite a bit with water, washed it over, and then I took a damp paper towel and I rubbed back out the highlight areas where uh, I, I didn't want to lose the lightness of the tone. And then I've also come back in with um, a little more very light paint and a very, very light touch with my bristle brush again to just create, um, bring back those highlighted areas of the squirrel after I washed the whole area down a little bit. You can see how runny that paint was that I used. By the way, it's dripping down the palette there. Going back in now with some greens and a soft, small, round brush. You can see I'm just looking at different areas. I'm, I'm studying my reference photo, but I'm also just looking at the painting itself now. So wherever I see um, maybe a large blob of paint. I don't like the edge of it. I don't. I don't. Doesn't feel like it resolved well enough. I'm just going back in and touching up. Now I'm going back in and touching up with a very dark green. Um, mostly just my green mixture with with some of that dark mixture in it. And right around my focal point, I'm creating areas of high contrast with the dark darks against the light lights again. That contrast is what draws your eye in the painting. So now I'm mixing up a very light green of, with just a little bit of blue and a little bit of yellow in it and just touching areas where I want to highlight those leaves. Think about where the sun is. Um, the sun is off and to the left but fairly high in the sky at this point. And so I'm just thinking about where would where would the sunlight be touching those leaves? You don't need to do a lot of this or you're going to end up with sort of a confetti um, look to things. But I'm looking especially for shapes that I feel turned out pretty well with the brush strokes I was using to make my leaves. And if I want to highlight some of them because I think the shape looks nice and looks very leaf-like, I'm going to use that very light bright color to highlight just certain areas and just generally areas around the squirrel. Now you can notice my palette is magically clean again. That's because I let the painting sit for a couple days. This, I call this the cool down period in my phases of painting and it's the time when you can take some time to just Put the painting where you can see it as you go about your daily life and then glance at it now and then and, you, and things will jump out at you that you don't see when you've just been spending hours uh, close to the painting. One thing that I wanted to do was add a little bit more detail in the flowers around the squirrel and uh, create a little some more interesting shapes, especially in the arcing branch. I felt like those blossoms there kind of followed a straight line and didn't have enough ins and outs to the outline shape there. So I wanted to go back in and create those shapes. Another thing that I found in looking at it was I felt like his tail wasn't quite large enough. It wasn't quite, um, it didn't just seem as, as fluffy and big as a, as a little squirrel tail generally does. So I'm going to be um, altering those shapes of the blossoms around him and then I'll be altering the shape of his tail as well. And again I just do that by starting with a darker tone, laying in the darker tone, coming back over with medium tones and lighter tones and just layer after layer. I also felt that the, some of the, the lights that I put in, the the yellow, white, yellow color that I'd used for that were a little too harsh. There wasn't quite enough uh, range of values in between. It went from a fairly dark to a really light. So I decided instead to come back in with some more medium tones in those flowers right around the squirrel and again create more detail by simply adding more layers of color and breaking those smaller shapes down, those larger shapes down into smaller shapes. And you can see how the all the layers that have been put in are really coming to um, benefit me now at this point because 
it adds texture and richness to the image with just those little little bits of all these different shades of pinks and peaches showing through. So you can see here the white I'm using this time is a little more pink and a little closer in value to the rest of the blossom and and so I'm getting those sort of intermediary values between the dark and the light which creates more realism. Using this uh, smaller brush again, it's a softer brush, and coming back in once more with some of these dark details, creating the shapes of, of the flowers with by creating the dark around them. Adding some more little of my white highlights. So again, this cooling off period gives you time to just look at the painting for a few days and it's amazing how things will jump out at you that you just didn't notice as you were painting it. I also keep a full length mirror behind me in my studio as I'm painting. That way I turn around really often and I can look in the mirror and you can see the image of your painting as if you were from a, a long distance away and that's really helpful as well. So as you can see, first of all I created a backdrop of more of those flowers for his tail to be silhouetted against. And then I just came in and enlarged his tail a little bit to make it a little fluffier and um, and try to give it a little more three dimension, have it a little more feel like it's coming out towards towards the viewer a little bit and create that active tail. Going back in with the dark to raise up the, the shape of the tail a little bit and then with my really ratty old bristle brush again moving my hand in the direction that the fur is growing. I think that's really important when you're painting animals to help you get that uh, fur texture is to move your whole hand around and paint in the direction of your of your fur. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little painting today. I have a teaching website, paintwithkarenalari.com, and you're most welcome and invited to join us there. We can, you can watch the videos, post your own paintings for critiques, and interact with all the other members that are on the website. This is Squirrel in the Blossoms. It's an acrylic painting, 9 by 12 by Karen Alari, and thanks for joining me today. Mm -hmm.